Thank you very much, Paul. And uh, we've now got some time for some questions uh, for, for Peter primarily, but you, you may have questions of, uh, of Paul as well in terms of that, uh, that local context. Uh, I'm also aware, uh, I had a meeting yesterday with um, the Urban Land Development Authority, which uh, I've got a, sort of another sort of particular brief, uh, I guess, in this sort of space as well, uh, although perhaps more on brownfield sites, I think, at this point in time. Uh, but who'd like to uh, open up with uh, questions or comments uh, for Peter? Always, always a slightly slow bit. Thank you very much. John, there's a microphone coming around. We'll need to use the mics because, as I mentioned earlier, we're uh, recording proceedings. Um, John Minery. Yep, I think that's working. Oh, John Minery from the University of Queensland. Um, I, I, it was an in interesting comparison between both P Peter's, well, the, the two talks. Uh, what, what, one of the problems with communities accepting higher densities is a thing called design and, and what the place, what, what the, the new buildings look like, what they appear to be. I mean, Br Brisbane's had a terrible history of the six packs, which is what everybody sees as median density. Um, on the other hand, you know, the Department of Housing, Department of Communities has an incredibly good reputation for really good medium density design. But I must admit that when, when Peter was showing some of the lower cost kinds of uh, construction that was possible, you know, um, um, manufactured housing, um, you know, off-site construction, it looked bloody terrible. And, and if those things were actually put into the kind of areas that you're looking at, I think there'll be a kind of huge community reaction against them. And that seriously worries me. If, if we're going to redevelop areas like this, it has to be with a very high quality of external design that, that will attract people, that will you know, make people enthusiastic about what's actually happening. And you know, my limited experience of, of you know, Queensland Department of Housing stuff is that it's pretty good, and maybe there's kind of a need for lessons to go back the other way. Mm. Okay, thank you, Peter. Uh, thank you, John. Um, Peter, did you want to um, remark on the appalling design uh, that? Uh yes. Well, um, it would would be good if um, my colleague Shane Murray was was here to talk uh, passionately about uh, design. He's um, uh, the, the the dean of uh, architecture at, at Monash, and. Uh, had a long history in social housing as well as uh, as, as design. So there, there is um, maybe selected images can can give the wrong impressions, um, and that's something for us to work on for the next presentation. Some uh, a, a wider variety, but it is important to be able to uh, understand um, the area in which redevelopment. Uh, could, could occur because it does have a history, it does have a context and a character, it does have uh, you know, uh, occupants. But you know, interacting more with architects over the last couple of years on, the, on this project than in the, in the past, there is a, um, you know, there, there, there is a, uh, some in, in incredibly good designs that can be brought to bear um, very rapidly given the technology that. Uh, the design professions now have in terms of sketch uh, sketch planning uh, and via charrettes uh, where you involve uh, the community. I, I spent a week in Montreal at the Eco City Conference just a few weeks ago, mainly you know in in charrettes um, where the Central Mortgage and Housing you know, Corporation is is really uh, pioneering uh, a lot of um, I guess methods for engaging with communities about how their uh, neighbourhoods could be you know, re redeveloped um, in, in line with the requirements of, in, of more intensive uh, development, but also to get uh, good outcomes in terms of design. I guess if uh, the, my other co-collaborator uh, here, Ron Wakefield, could have been here, he's the Professor of Construction uh, Management, and he spent most of his uh, professional career uh, trying to um, uh, develop routes into uh, manufactured housing. One of the critical um, barriers that, that we have in this area are the difference in price points currently um, involved in delivering low-rise, high-density in, in, in the um, inner and middle suburbs at, at, a, at a price that can be um, afforded um, by those who want to make, make a switch. 
and there is a massive proportion of houses, households in the middle ring uh, where they've aged in place. Um, there is massive under-occupancy in, uh, in these areas. Um, there are a number of different market segments that are looking um, to either continue to live in, in the area that they were grown up in, so those that are in their kind of early 20s through, through 30s that are attracted to um, a, a kind of a more intensive uh, lifestyle, as well as the baby boomers that are looking to move out of these um, underutilised uh, houses um, and yards uh, that may be becoming a problem. So <coughs> there, we've identified some significant market segments, but both of them uh, are inhibited by the, uh, the price points in getting into medium density. So um, I, I take your point I, uh, in, in agreement. Um, but uh, we're of the opinion that um, manufactured housing you know, can deliver um, lower cost um, dwellings and uh, there is no reason why they can't be well designed and maybe the modular boxes that you saw there that went into Little Flinders uh, Street, what was called the Little Hero uh, development, um, uh, won't, wouldn't be representative of the middle, middle suburbs. That's more indicative of um, you know, the, the inner uh, urban um, a high, high rise uh, solution which is not really part of the intention uh, in, in, this, in this space. But it's also more rapid. If, if you can get into manufactured modular housing, you can make the, uh, um, you can undertake the redevelopment <coughs> in these areas at a much uh, more rapid rate, so you don't have the same level of disruption that characterises uh, a lot of the redevelopment that you find uh, uh, taking place. So there's a Other questions or comments that people want to make? Um, one just <coughs> there and then one here. Thank you. G'day. Uh, Dave from Minister Struthers' office. Um, just you talked about one of the challenges being um, that there was a lack of uh, successful examples uh, in Australia and you know, obviously we've got some stuff happening here but I would still be interested if there were other also successful examples that through your research you found internationally that you could point us to. Is it, is it documented in the research paper or is there, are there places you'd recommend looking for in terms of where this has been done well? Thank you. A whole lot of uh, places where it's, um, where it's being done, uh, done well. And I think this is where, you know, I'm excited to hear what uh, Paul has to say. And maybe I'm foreshadowing something that, that I shouldn't, but I think um, uh, Shane Murray is looking to uh, uh, make a submission to Uhuri for um, a follow-on project that is um, going to involve this, the, the state uh, housing authorities uh, in Melbourne, in, in Victoria, New South Wales, and, and Brisbane with a view to actually taking it that one step uh, step further because exemplars are incredibly uh, incredibly important. Um, you've, you've got, um, there, are, there are many examples in, in brown fields, um, but, but not, not in the grey fields where you've got areas that have been, you know, that, are, that have been occupied uh, and people really have to be engaged to make a decision as to whether they are going to be part of a, a regeneration uh, and buy into that, uh, that project uh, and there are different models in which you know, they, can, they can buy in or they can just sell into it and move some, some, uh, somewhere else. Uh, most people tend to like the area uh, in which they're, they're living uh, and so if they can continue to, to do that that's an attraction to being able to buy in if you have a basis for you know, engaging them on that particular uh, in that particular financial model. <coughs> in microcosm, there's two streets in Stafford, uh, Lutana and Badina. They face on to um, Park, uh, Keith Payne VC Park. And um, in fact, in that area, we were quite low density and we have redeveloped and the private sector has redeveloped to medium density. It's, it remains a fantastic um, built form and urban form and we've had, in fact, really good successes. Uh, our most recent one there is a very large site to the northern end of that precinct up against Padua College where we went to the market with a very large site and said, 
we're prepared to deal with the market. Here are sketch plans for 12 one-bed seniors units we would like to own after the deal is done. Went to the market and said, what dollars, what's the dollar adjustment for you to keep the balance of the site and for us to get 12 one-bed seniors units in this pattern on this site? Um, we got great outcome because it was a builder developer who was able to build the product very cost effectively. They were working with a sketch design, so they used the buildability of their own company's processes to deliver it cost effectively to us. And they are now marketing and have started construction on their component of it. So in microcosm, we're talking about a couple of hectares um, where that change has occurred. So that's Badina and Lutana Streets in mm. Stafford. Good. Thank you. Sounds like there'd be important case studies to document. Mm. There's a question here. Thank you. Um, uh, Carolyn and I are involved in a, um, <coughs> uh, a research project at the moment which is largely a design-based charrette process um, about looking at innovative models for uh, um, aged care infill. Um, I noticed that the work that you've been doing is really about individual lots and the redevelopment of lots. I'm wondering if you've examined the possibility of subdivision within those lots where houses are retained but uh, surplus backyard areas are then redeveloped cooperatively through, say, four lots or, or larger areas, um, and whether that was a model that you've considered. And uh, following on from that, whether or not you see there, there's a role to play for, for not-for-profits, for instance, who are reasonably cash-rich, who could, who, who are service, housing service providers who may be able to step in and actually lead and develop some innovations in that area as well. Thank you. Yeah, there's, there's a section in the, uh, in the report um, I think it goes under, you know, finance models or innovative finance models. Uh, and so we don't have any particular one in, in, in mind. I think there were about uh, eight to ten different types of, um, you know, e examples of, of different ways of moving forward, uh, including the ones that, that, that you mentioned, um, as well as the very, you know, um, you know um, I guess gra grassroots uh, e examples of... Uh, groups in, in Melbourne that we're more familiar with uh, that uh, have a collective uh, interest uh, in green development, living as, a, as a, an urban community and basically have provided, you know, secured their own finance and are now looking for, you know, suitable sites uh, to develop because they live in different parts of, you know, the inner areas of, uh, of Melbourne. So there are many different uh, approaches. but. The, the end result of that one would be, you know, a consolidated, pre, a small precinct um, th that would meet all of the performance requirements that they have, which was more intensive development, areas for gardens, community, uh, et cetera, uh, et cetera. Um, a lot of the stakeholders that we, uh, or a significant number of stakeholders that we had at our, um, our, uh, our workshops uh, were from, um, you know, community housing, co-housing, um, um, government housing uh, areas as well as the private private sector so it's a matter of you know what what model fits a particular uh, particular setting I guess um, and uh, that's about mm -hmm. okay thank you uh, I'll take uh, one last comment or question if anybody has one if not will yes thank you yep hi Caroline Osborne from the University of the Sunshine Coast. Um, we've been doing, as Phil said, some research with, with older people using participative research methodologies. So we used uh, photo voice and design charrettes to try and get their understanding of how they experience place. And I just wanted to ask you for the three precincts you're talking about, what are the, the differences, I guess, um, in the types of uh, infrastructure um, and the relationship to, to space and the kind of um, dwellings that would be in those particular precincts that would be different from each other? Well, they were just, they were three archetypal um, possibilities that, uh, that were identified as a result of um, discussions in, in, in the workshops. One of them was the, consol if, if that's what I'm interpreting your, your question as, one of them was the consolidated site where you're able to, uh, you know, have contiguous, you know, uh, ownership. That's was seen by the developers as providing, you know, the, the best possible way of being able to uh, 
bring a range of design uh, options as well as uh, infrastructure, new infrastructures uh, in, into play, uh, like distributed energy uh, generation, uh, which you know, may be able to service that whole precinct as distinct from individual uh, dwellings. So as you move away from the more consolidated sites, um, you know, some of the options you know, are, are, dim are diminished in terms of um, you know, alternative infrastructures that you can add in, as well as uh, being able to um, you know, redesign the spaces that people can, um, can operate in. Uh, if you remove um, the detached uh, dwelling and, and, and yards, if you have a consolidated site, there are many opportunities for uh, positioning, um, I guess, spaces for um, meetings, work, uh, et cetera, et cetera, as well as the, uh, the open spaces that can be more shared. Um, but the um, design professions that were involved in this pro process wanted to maintain the other options as well as a basis for exploring, you know, what might be, you know, able to be done in a more realistic kind of real world situation where you can't necessarily um, assemble all of the all of the sites that you might want to. So it's a matter of saying, well, what what can you do with what you can assemble within a particular period of time? Because the period of time that you have to assemble really is, was one of the critical barriers that were identified by the private sector as to why they don't play in that, uh, that, that space. Because the risks are so high in the time it takes to assemble you know, the, the, the sites. So this is one of the advantages you know, in having you know, social government housing as, as, as a lead agency in this area because you know, a lot of that is already kind of uh, done. Um, but the assembly of sites is one of the critical uh, things. So, not to want to put a barrier on what is possible with regeneration. That's why those others are seen there as alternatives, which we begin to explore. Um, subsequently, as we get you know, funding from different sources to, to work on those areas of innovation that we identified in that, in that first slide, we've, we've essentially said, well, these are the five or six substantive areas where innovation needs to, uh, to, to occur. And piece by piece, those of us who've begun this work are looking to get you know, funding from other sources, and we've been successful in two of those subsequent to the Uhuri study to help us you know, um, understand more and, and get to actual uh, examples uh, of what, what can be done. Uh, we must move on. Please join me in thanking Peter for his presentation. <laughs>